Hare Krishna, everyone. You're listening to the Late Morning Program with Namras, the number one Hare Krishna podcast in the world. I'm here. Very excited to talk to the spiritual scientist, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu himself. Uh, Prabhu, thank you so much for joining me. Hare Krishna. Wonderful to be here with you. I think uh, in every tradition there is the Adi, the founder of various things. So I think you're the Adi, Adi some topic of the podcasts in our tradition. So, oh, Krishna. Thank you. Thank I'm you. happy to be a humble follower in your footsteps. <laughs> no, no, Prabhu. You're, you're doing amazing things. So, Chaitanya, for those of you who don't know, Chaitanya Jaran Prabhu has um, uh, an amazing website where he does daily Gita uh, realizations that he shares himself, uh, that he writes himself. We'll, we'll talk about that later. He also has his own podcast called The Monk's Podcast, who we're very, you know, lots of amazing Krishna conscious material and content. Uh, we'll talk about that as well. But first of all, I'd love to talk to Prabhu about his um, personal life in the sense of how did he come, how did you come into Krishna consciousness? How did you get in contact with devotees? Okay. Thank you. For, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Yes. And it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. So, uh, thank you. So broadly, as far as my Krishna consciousness is concerned, I'd say there are three strands of thought or three strands in my life which came together. The first was I was born and brought up in India and India is a very academically competitive society. So where the goal of a student's life is to be first in class, do well academically and of course come to America in future. So I grew up with that and I was always among the bright students. I was among the top students, but somehow I was never the top, never number one. Mm. And throughout my junior school, high school and then college, that was something which was always a great dissatisfaction for me. And then I gave my GRE exam just for coming to America for postgrad studies. And I always liked English as a language. One of my hobbies in my childhood was just to pick up a dictionary and memorize words. So in general, in, <laughs> in general, Indians are always good at math and analytical ability, but it's English that they falter. So I did quite well in my GRE at that time. You know, I got 2350 out of 2400. I was the first in the state of Maharashtra. I was the first, not just in my college, I was the first in the history of my college. So it was, in one sense, all my dreams come true. And yet, after a few moments of Yahoo and elation, I soon realized that just looking at the score sheet doesn't give any satisfaction. So the satisfaction comes when people congratulate. And then after some time, it grows old. And somehow it happened that three of my friends, one after another, they all forgot to congratulate me. <laughs> and it, it just, I was with them. And when the first person didn't congratulate me, I was a little annoyed. Second person didn't congratulate me, I was, uh, I was irritated. The third person didn't congratulate me, I was enraged. But at the same time, I didn't look, I want to look pathetic. I think, why are you not congratulating me? But then somehow it struck me at that time, it was as if I look at myself from above myself, not actual, but conceptually and say, hey, wait a minute, before this GRE achievement, I could just interact with people and get along with my life. But now, instead of this GRE achievement making me happy, it has made me more dependent on others for my happiness. Mm. That, wow. that unless people congratulate me, I'm not happy. So it struck me, is this what I want to do in my life in future? I could give another exam, I could crack it, I could, uh, I could become a scientist and I could get awards. And, but I would always be dependent on others for my happiness. So that's what started me thinking, is there something else? Is there some form of happiness which is not dependent on externals? Wow. And that's that's when one of my friends uh, introduced me to the Bhagavad Gita. He himself had got the Bhagavad Gita and started reading it. 
so when i read it i i used to like i used to like reading books so i had read other bhagavad gitas before but when somehow when i read this bhagavad gita i was probably at a receptive moment in my life and when i came to 622 in the gita where krishna says yam labdhva cha param labham manyate nadikam tata yasmin sthito na dukhena guruna api vichalyate he says that having achieved this there is nothing more to achieve one becomes one doesn't crave for anything else and having achieved this no matter what dissatisfaction one what distress one experiences no matter how great one is not disturbed by that so when i read that i felt this is real achievement in life this is actually describing the state of samadhi the state of absorption in the divine and i said this is what really i should be striving for because this if i achieve then there will be real happiness so that was one very significant impetus so you could say uh, there are people who become frustrated with failure i became frustrated with success mm-hmm. and <laughs> uh, so and then so the, was that friend that gave you the bhagavad gita was he a devotee already or was he also oh yeah he is already a devotee and he is a good friend of mine even now oh really so. wonderful <laughs> and yeah. so did you eventually like you join the temple yeah i'll come to that so that was yeah. as i said this one strand of thought so this sure. was in 1996 basically i was introduced to the bhagavad gita and then i was in third year of my engineering at that time so simultaneously i always had a lot of faith in the power of knowledge to transform so one aspect was of course scientific knowledge and i saw how scientific knowledge had transformed society i would love to read about the biographies of scientists and especially not just scientific discoveries but how they made those discoveries so i felt knowledge and education could transform society and i had this urge within me that i wanted to share knowledge so while i was studying engineering i joined a social welfare organization and they did various activities <clears throat> so i used to go to a nearby slum behind my college a uh, economically deprived zone and then there i would teach offer free tuitions as a part of that welfare organization to the kids in the slum and i used to teach them various subjects english history math and we became friends and after some time those kids started opening up that most of them were from dysfunctional homes and uh, the biggest problem was alcohol alcohol induced violence the fathers would usually drink and when they would drink then there was domestic violence thereafter now when i met those fathers and they were actually quite nice people i felt they were they were grateful that i was coming and teaching their children but then these kids told me that once they drink it is like they become a different person so at that time i talked with the uh, uh, authorities of this welfare organization and there was already that thought going on so we decided instead of just offering education we could also invite some other people who could help people get off alcohol so i was not the speaker for that but i was a connector for that and one of my friends also was doing something similar he was doing it for a village and so we started working in that and my friend worked very hard for that area and he used to so i used to go to this particular small area within the city and he used to go to a nearby village so we did help a lot of people to get off alcohol at least alcoholism we can say Uh, and we're quite happy about it but one evening my friend came back crestfallen i asked him what happened he said there had been the local political elections municipal elections and one of the candidates in order to woo the uh, woo the electorate woo the voters he had brought about two truck loads of free alcohol for everyone oh my goodness and not only the fathers but even their kids had drunk so that was like a big setback for us and then so we started thinking that if, through education we are opening doors for people but it, it seems that there is something inside people that prevents them from walking ahead from taking those doors and walking through those doors so that was something which quite disappointed me and at the same time as i as i was observing the world around me that it was there's one student who was 
like in some sense my hero he was about 3 years senior to me and he had been the university topper throughout all his 4 years the university mm. and he had got at that time the highest paying job in the history of our college but he was also a chain smoker and in 6 months after he got that job he was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer and within a year he passed away so i talk with him so it's you know he could solve i, I did electronics and telecommunications engineering so he could solve uh, engineering problems so brilliantly hmm. so i just somehow couldn't figure it out that if he can understand how br- easy how if he is brilliant enough to s- understand this why can't he understand that he is actually courting disease and death by smoking somehow he said that i can't think unless i smoke so so what struck me from this incident was that that this something self destructive within us it's it is uh, it goes beyond the educational boundaries that is not that education is an is a protector against the self destructive force within and again when i read the bhagavad gita in 336 arjuna asks you know what is it that impels one to self destructive actions atakena prayuktoyam papam charati purusha anichchana pivarshnaya baladi vanyojita so by force as if so i said yeah this is the question which i have also been having and uh, it's not that i was just talking about people being alcoholics or chain smokers you know i didn't have any gross vices but i was also infamous for having a short temper so really? i started realizing that this this force to a it may be a, to a greater degree in others but to a smaller degree the self destructive force is there within me also so that struck me it took me some time to understand uh what the gita's answer to that question was and how that answer was applicable but then when i was introduced to bhakti and i started practicing the process of bhakti especially studying philosophy and or trying to live that philosophy i found that it just uh, led to a transformation that my own anger went away one of my room partners who was in the hostel he was just sliding towards alcoholism and he also started practicing krishna consciousness started pra- practicing bhakti yoga and he just gave it all up so i realized that this could be the way ahead that this is the kind of knowledge that is really required in society that where education so nowadays the, the, way, the way i put it is that you know, scientific education can make the outer world better spiritual education can make the inner world better mm. so and we need both to improve the world and improve ourselves so scientific education gives us control over externals it is spiritual education which gives us control over internals so that's so that's the time when i felt that that this is what i should really focus on that i would like to study this and share this so that was also a significant impetus for uh, for choosing to dedicate my life to studying and sharing the wisdom of the bhagavad gita uh i have a question regarding because you you see that science and krishna consciousness sometimes devotees have even left krishna consciousness or devote or people are not even attract are not attracted to krishna consciousness because it's from from their perspective it's not scientific in the sense of it's a lot of like revelation like you you know how they say the 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 taste of the pudding is in the eating so people we how so we say oh try krishna consciousness and see how you feel and thing but that's not scientific per se so what was it about krishna consciousness and about the bhagavad gita which made you kind of become uh maybe not unscientific but kind of like what you were like oh this is this is cool but it it kind of goes against science in in some sort of way yeah <laughs> i would say two things it was first of all i i grew up in a culture where i knew i'd heard about the soul and of course we had we used to worship in our homes i was right. born in the brahmin family so that way it was there but i had never heard any logical rational explanation for the concepts of soul or for the concept of god 
So now the uh, there when I encountered devotee scientists who were doing research to present uh, Krishna the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita scientifically. It struck me that this is amazing. So the evidence for, I won't go so far as to use the word proof, because proof is something which ultimately every individual has to decide. But there is strong evidence for of past life memories and near-death experiences and other things, which which points to the existence of a soul. In fact, later on, I have I have written a book on this topic called Demystifying Reincarnation. So the point was that I found the scientific evidence like a new vista of knowledge. Although I considered myself reasonably well read, somehow I had never encountered this. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are aspects of Krishna consciousness that are not scientific, but I would say it's not, it's more than that. They are not unscientific. They are trans scientific. So it's not that they are against science. They are above science. So let me just uh, share a screen, the simple sure. diagram over here. So this is, is a diagrammatic depiction. Now, if you consider the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavatam, there are parts of it which, which agree with science. There are parts of it which contradict science and there are part of it which transcend science. Now, this is just a schematic representation, not actually, uh, you could say, representative of the size. If we overall study the Bhagavad, study the scriptures, we'll find that what agrees with science is very small, what contradicts science is very small, what transcends science is the majority. Hmm? And this transcendent, transcending science, that is what is critical. So that the science can provide us means. Now, you want to do this? How can you do that? Say, right now we have a means by which we are talking all the way in opposite parts of the, almost opposite parts of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> science yeah. provides us means, yeah. but spirituality provides us meaning. What is the meaning of life? So these are two different domains. There are some overlaps, but for some people, the contradictory parts seem to be they become too highlighted in people's minds. And that's because they often look at the religion rituals that are involved there in, in religion. I can't, I can't believe this. I can't do this. But beyond that, there is a huge amount of philosophy. And if you understand the philosophy, then things become relatively easier to practice. So, so my understanding is that spirituality is also in its own way, like a science. So it is a science of a different nature. It is not science in the way we normally consider it. So there's, I have written about this in also books. In science, we have theory and we have experiment. Similarly, in spirituality, we have philosophy and we have religion. So just as in science, the theory postulates that maybe things work in this particular way. When Newton saw fruit, uh, apple falling, he postulated maybe there is a, something called a force which attracts part, particles of matter to each other. And then he did experiments. So when the experiment is done, okay, an apple fell, does another fruit fall, does a stone fall? And not just in UK, does it fall in France and does it fall in America, does it fall in various parts of the world? So that is the experiment. So similarly, in spirituality, there is philosophy. The philosophy tells us about the nature of reality. And in, uh, if, in fact, the word philosophy itself means philo, philo is love, so force is truth, so lover of truth or seeker of truth. So philosophy is the search for truth. And religion, while many people equate it with ritu rituals, religion is actually a set of practices that are meant to enable us to give realization of the philosophy. So this is what Krishna talks about in 9.2 in the Bhagavad Gita. Raja Vidya Raja Guhyam. Pavitram idam uttamam, pratyakshavagamam dharmyam susukham kartum avyam. So pratyakshavagamam dharmyam. So he says that I will give you the knowledge. So that knowledge, Raja Vidya, Raja Guhim, that is philosophy. I'll give you the philosophy. But then he says along with that, I will give you the process. Pavitram idam uttamam, that which will purify you. And by this pratyakshavagamam, you'll get realization. And what is the essence of the realization? It is Susukam. 
you will find joy, fulfillment coming within you. And how do we know that the fulfillment is there? It is bhakti pareshanubhav virakti ranyatracha. How anybody can claim I am inter internally contented. But the test would be how much are you dependent on external sources of happiness? So if I say I'm internally fulfilled and I have to smoke and I have to drink and I have to do a hundred other things, I can't, uh, I, get, I can't live without watching TV. Uh, I can't live without, uh, without my I periodic, can't. whatever. Sorry. But yes, wait, sorry. With your, without one's own, one's phone or something. You yeah. Can't so without. If, yeah. Without, so if I can't live without playing video games on my phone or surfing my social media, right. then that does indicate that I'm not internally content. So yeah. in this sense, Krishna consciousness, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's science in the normal sense of the word, because quite often science is associated with with a naturalistic approach. We look at material phenomena and we try to explain material phenomena. But in the sense of two things, rationality and repeatability. That the basic philosophy of Krishna consciousness is rational. That there is a non-material essence to us, in our, that, our, that is our core. And that there is the ultimate reality with whom we have a loving relationship. And the basic tenets of Krishna consciousness are rational. And then repeatability. One second, one second. How's, how's that rational about our relationship with Krishna? How's that rational? How can that, okay. that be expressed rationally? Okay, so we could put it this way that <clears throat> we all have a longing to love. And not just love, but love forever. Most of the movie, a significant portion of the movies and novels are about romance. And most romance, at least it aspires to be forever, happily ever after, as we say. Now, if we consider from a purely logical perspective, that there is no happily ever after. Because even if we say we have a happy relationship, it's not going to last forever. So the question comes up from a biological or sociological perspective, where do we get a desire for which there is obviously no fulfillment in nature? Say to give an example, say if somebody is living in a remote African village and one day uh, uh, that, that, that village, that tribe has no connection with the world, no internet, no social media, they're just living in their own universe. And one day this child, a boy goes to his mother and asks, Mom, mom, I want a pizza. Now, the first question the mother would ask is, what's a pizza? And even if she knows what a pizza, pizza, pizza is, she says, how did you come to know about the pizza? Because there's nothing in his environment that would gi even give him knowledge, leave alone the desire. So, similarly, there is nothing in our environment which lasts forever. So then how do we get the desire to love something forever or love someone forever? So the desire for love is understandable from a, from a purely reductionistic, materialistic perspective. The desire to love forever, how do we understand that? Where does it come from? So if a desire has no source in the external world, then it suggests that the only source of that desire would be from the internal world. That means there is something within us that longs for everlasting love. So this desire is not biological, this is not sociological, this is a spiritual desire within us. And now we could debate whether this desire is actually going to be fulfilled or not, whether there is an ultimate reality, who can reciprocate love with us. These are matters of debate. So it's not, I won't say, when I say Krishna consciousness is rational, I'm not saying that it is, it is rationally, rationally uh, irrefutable. Hmm? Because ultimately, as I said, this is, different people can argue for rationality from different perspective. But it is, it is rationally intelligible. That we have a longing to live forever and a longing to love forever. So the longing to live forever suggests that there is a score to us that is eternal. And the longing to love forever suggests 
that there is an object of love that is eternal. And now what exactly these are and how all that relationship is to be developed, that is a whole different dimension of knowledge. So in that, the basic tenets of Krishna consciousness in terms of the existence of the soul, in terms of the ultimate object of love, in terms of the philosophy of karma, explaining, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that also, the I didn't go into third strand of thought. If you want, I'll go into that, but let me complete this. That the rationality and repeatability. Repeatability means that it's not linearly repeatable. It's not that, say, if I, not like gravity, if I take this and drop this, it's going to fall. If I take this, it's going to fall. So it's very linearly, predictably repeatable. But in Krishna consciousness, because it involves individuals and individual consciousness, it's not that predictably repeatable. But overall, if somebody practices Bhakti Yoga, they experience inner contentment. They experience outer capacity for distancing themselves from unhealthy habits, unhealthy behaviors. The exact pace may vary. The exact change may vary. But that is something which... I've seen across the world people experiencing that. So in that those terms, in terms of rationality and repeatability, we can say Krishna consciousness is scientific in its own way. Mm. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you for expressing that. Tell us a little bit about then what happened, uh, how you joined the temple and all that. Okay, yeah. So maybe I'll just come back to the third part. So I said first part was my own achievements. Second was my social contribution contributions. A third was my relationships. You know that I, when I was in my school, uh, uh, I was among the toppers in my tenth school, tenth standard. So when I was one, I had polio. So I was just walking one day, and uh, I just fell, fell down, and I never could walk normally after that. So. Uh, apparently, I was given the polio vaccine, but the doctor who was supposed to give the vaccine, he we were living in a remote part of Maharashtra. So his his fridge broke down or something like that happened. And the vaccine dose was not proper. So basically, I ended up getting now. Now that can be a like a, in today's world about vaccination, it can be a polar, uh, inflammatory <laughs> point word. anyway. <laughs> but anyway, I don't want to get into that issue. I right. never really thought about it from that perspective. But basically, I got polio. And I couldn't walk normally. Uh, fortunately, I had very loving parents. And my parents decided that they will do everything possible to help me have a normal childhood. And to take care of me and to try to, of course, heal me. They tried various things. Nothing really healed the polio. But they took extreme care of me. They decided we will not have any other children for at least 10 more years till he's grown up. And so uh, when my parents would talk with, um, with, with relatives and other acquaintances, so this topic would come up and they would say that you know, I was since my childhood, I was quite good at studies, good at language and math. So my relatives and my parents would talk and they would say that, yeah, you know, what he lacks in physical ability he has an intellectual ability. So what God has not given him physical ability, God has given him an intellectual ability. So when I would hear that, I would think, who is this being God who has such absolute control over my life? You know, he decides what to give and what to take. <laughs> so this was, I was a small child but the, at that time. But then I grew up and then <clears throat> when I was in 10th standard, at that time, my mother got blood cancer, advanced leukemia. And we detected very late. So she passed away within one month after the detection. So that was a big shock for me. My father used to have a, tra was a traveling job. So I was mostly, I was connected with my mother. So that started making me think, what is going on in life? You know, that we form relationships. I was naturally very attached to my mother. And it just, uh, it was quite shattering for me at that time. So that's when, I, although I used to read a lot, that's when I started reading philosophical books. And then, so when I was reading the Bhagavatam, so I was introduced to Krishna Bhakti, and then when I was reading the Bhagavatam, at that time, I read in the fourth canto, uh, Dhruva Maharaj's mother says to him, that whatever love I can offer you, uh, Lord Vishnu can offer you millions of times of more love. Millions of mothers like me cannot offer you as much love as Lord Vishnu can. 
So that struck me very much. Because till that time, sometimes when we have the presentation of Krishna conscious philosophy, it can be very world rejecting. So, for example, one of the pastimes which I had heard and I found very disturbing, that was the pastime of Chitra Ketu, where he says, which mother, which father? Yeah. And it sounded very heartless to me. That, okay, you may say, okay, I may have had many mothers and many fathers. I didn't deny the philosophy. Yes, I could have had many mothers and many fathers. But I couldn't deny what my parents had done for me. Especially, uh, so, I just felt that it was very dismissive of the extent of sacrifice that they had done for me. So, when I read the fourth canto, so, it, it really helped me reconcile. So, when we say the world and its pleasures and love and relationships are all temporary, no, that doesn't mean that they are false. It doesn't mean that they are zero. You know, people, when, when our family members take care of us, love us, when there is affection between friends, it is real. You know, because why? Because again, from a, if it's a rational perspective, when Dhruva is, Dhruva's mother is telling him that Lord Vishnu can offer you millions of times more love than what can offer. If her love is zero, millions of times of zero is also zero. So when she's saying millions of times, what it means is her love is not zero. Her love is real and Lord Vishnu's love is far, far more. So I felt that that, that that helped me to make a sense of a lot of things. And I felt that you know, this is the relationship I want to develop. So that was one of the main reasons. So this that, that particular experience of, so you could say, the temporality of uh, uh, relationships, that had a significant effect on me. Of course, I still am well connected with my father and my brother. And we, we do have good relationship, but overall I felt that this is this developing this eternal relationship and trying to help others develop that eternal relationship. That is what I want to do as the priority of my life. So I completed my engineering in 1998. I worked in a software company. I had an opportunity to come to America. At that time, I had a maternal uncle who had his own company and he wanted me to come and uh, maybe be a successor or whatever in future. But uh, I disappointed him and a lot of people at that time. So uh, that was in 1999, I, oh, wow. I joined ISKCON as a brahmachari. And then since then, I have been studying and sharing the Bhagavad Gita and other Bhakti wisdom texts. Wow, 1999. And then so you stayed for 10 years in the ashram. And then you decided to, how did you? come about where you came to the West and now you've been you've been spending so much time in America, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's... Uh, so, when I was in, in Pune, one of my main services was basically uh, answering difficult questions. When I was, because I was quite a logical person, when I was introduced to Krishna Conscious also, I would ask a lot of questions to people. In fact, that was one of the reasons I started my Monk's podcast also. I love to discuss philosophy and ask questions. Sure. So because I asked a lot of questions, I got a lot of understanding and I would answer questions. So I, I would try to answer questions from a rational, logical perspective. I have another website called The Spiritual Scientist, where I've answered almost about 10,000 questions on different subjects in audio and some of them are transcriptions. So that was my main service. So I would travel in India. Uh, go to mainly various youth centers and youth, uh, many young people would have difficult questions which other preachers may find difficult to understand. I would try to answer them. So then in, I like also was writing. Like you would do debates and things? Not exactly debates, but it was more of students who had come for programs. I see. And at the end of, say, a course. So after a course would get over, so the local preachers would do the course. Yeah. But after the course was over, there are always people who have some unanswered questions. So they, at the end of the course, they would put a QA session for me and I would visit and I would do the QA session. I may not do the whole course because I was traveling various places, but I would do. So my classes would be short class and long question answers like that. Right. So, so that was one of my main services, basically uh, giving a rational, explain, rational presentation of Bhakti wisdom. Then I was also writing and in 2006, 2007, when His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj, who is my spiritual master, published Journey Home. So at that time, he had given me that book to go through before it was published. He said, tell me what you think about it. So he had given it to several of his uh, uh, disciples. 
I was fortunate, although I was quite young at that time in Krishna consciousness. So I told Maharaj that Maharaj, the stories and everything is so dramatic, so thrilling. But what struck me the most about this was the tone. He said, you are not speaking in this book like a teacher speaking to a student or a guru speaking to a disciple. You are the whole book is written in the mood of a of a seeker sharing with other seekers. So Maharaj appreciated that. And Maharaj said, yes, this is the tone you need for reaching to Western audiences. And if you can also learn to write in this tone, you will also be able to reach to Western audiences and India is also becoming westernized. So you'll be able to start reaching to Indians. So from that time, so that uh, that interaction with Maharaj sowed the seeds for me. So I said, what exactly? is when he says this stone, why did he adopt this stone and what, why does it need it for Western audiences? So that's the time I started getting interested. So I started re reading everything I could get hands on, did it my devotees for Western audiences. Then I started looking at Christian teachers, Buddhist teachers, Advaitic teachers, how they were presenting. So basically one of the main differences that struck me is that Eastern societies, India, China, Russia, all of them are still significantly hierarchical. So if somebody has an official position of authority, there is a significant amount of respect towards authority. And then, okay, you learn. So actually, in one sense, when you encounter authority, you begin with faith and the authority doesn't seem reasonable, then there is doubt. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, in the West, you could say, especially if somebody in the position of authority, especially religious authority, it is a part of a religious institution. So the default attitude is doubt. So, and then you have to earn faith. You have to earn faith, actually. So among various things, this struck me that the Western society is much more egalitarian. And that's why that tone, not of, uh, not of like, instructing, but sharing. That's so essential for reaching out to Western audience. So then uh, around 2014, so 2007, 2008, I started doing the study. I continued my outreach in India, continued my studies and speaking in whatever way I could. But in 2014, so from 2010, 2011, I was getting invitations to, to travel outside India. But 2014 was the first year I actually uh, started traveling. I got the blessings of senior devotees of my spiritual master and other senior Vaishnavas. And since then I started coming and I got a fairly good response. Mm -hmm to the talks. Many senior leaders in America, they appreciated it. And then, so one thing that struck me when I came to America was how, again, egalitarian the culture was. In India, even if there is a senior devotee from our own generation, say like my Shiksha Guru, who may be five or 10 years senior to me, it's almost like you look up to him. But when I came to America, I was talking with um, Prabhupada disciples, and they were so accessible and so friendly and down to earth. Right. So it was quite, a, I came from a very conservative Brahmacharya ashram with a very hierarchical structure. Yeah. And I was exposed to the egalitarian culture. It was quite, a, quite a, a revealing experience for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I had to very broadly reconceptualize my conceptions of my understanding of what Krishna consciousness meant. You know, I was giving a class in a Western outreach center and I, there was a nice question answers. There were boys and girls. They all asked questions. I answered them and they answered, they asked some questions uh, after the class. Some of them came privately and talked. And the preacher who had organized that program, uh, who was the organizer of that center, he was also there and he's a senior Prabhupada disciple. So after the program, he told me, uh, that you can, you might, you will be able to do quite, if you spend time in America, you can contribute to Western outreach quite a bit. You'll be helpful in that. You will be effective in that. I says, why, why do you feel like that? I thought maybe he said, my question answers were good. My presentation of philosophy was good. So he said that, you know, you are not uncomfortable around women. Right. Now, when you That's huge. That, yeah. I said, and, he said, and at first, my first reaction was, is that an appreciation or a criticism? <laughs> <laughs> wow, interesting. So, so, so the point was that 
because they the boys and girls they were all asking questions and i tried to answer them as much as they could yeah so so what he said is that actually to some extent uh in india gender separation it's quite natural and especially in india monks they are, even indian women understand monks you have to keep a distance from them but if if especially anybody in the audience feels that you don't want to be with them say yeah. if a preacher is answering a question and if a woman is asking the question and you just feel that you know you just want to end the interaction move ahead then they, that alienates them a lot so he said i didn't sense that in you so in that sense it's appreciation so it is curious what he appreciated specifically <laughs> very interesting what so, other what other struggles were there in understanding like the western culture when you're interacting with them so much you know going traveling all over the place what other kind of observations did you make yeah i would say they they fall in three different categories first is of course the gender interactions i remember i was in a college program and then there was this uh, girl she asked a question why do religions fight among each other so then i answered a question elaborately and she, uh, i could see she was quite happy with the answer so after the class she came and she said you know this question has been burdening me for so long for so long i'm so grateful that you answered this question can i give you a hug coming <laughs> 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 now this was something just unimaginable for somebody for me coming from india fortunately this happened after a couple of years i was there so right. over a couple of years i had realized that you know for in the west hug is just a expression of affection it is and there are different kinds of hugs also which mean different things but yeah. still you cannot say no and the same way you cannot say yes right so i did a what to do so then i just turned toward the the preacher would organize the program he was also an indian i said you know you, i just indicate to you help me so he helped me but in an entirely unexpected way he said that you know actually he's a monk so on his behalf you can hug me <laughs> he told that guy <laughs> it's so funny <laughs> and then, that was not the end of it his wife was there so he says i am his wife on his behalf you can hug me <laughs> Wow. Was, she, was, the, was the girl so, satisfied with that? Yeah, yeah, okay. The That's husband why both of them they gave a joint hug to her and I smiled. So I was this. Right. So I would say a lot of experiences with respect to gender interactions that was primary. But overall yeah. it struck me that uh, that people were very very uh, earnest in their spiritual search. So for example you know sometimes and i would go to colleges and speak uh, now i have not uh, i visited colleges in india india still is conservative although it's changing but still significantly conservative so sometimes uh, some of the boys and the girls would be very very scantily dressed right and yet at the end of the class when they would come and ask questions and they would have such serious questions so it started i i realized that you cannot judge people simply by the way they are dressed or their externals you know for them that dress might just be a normal part of their culture and that their dress is not a statement about their spiritual interest or spiritual lack of lack of spiritual interest so the idea would be the default conception would be that you know if somebody is flaunting their body like this they are so much in bodily consciousness what what interest they would have spiritually so but it was not like that at all so i started realizing that there are so many cultural assumptions which we superimpose on spirituality that that means a particular person dresses in a particular way that means they are not really spiritually interested or how can they be spiritually interested a particular person dresses in a particular way they must be spiritually interested it doesn't work like that so that's why i said that uh, i had to broaden my understanding of what krishna consciousness was significantly so one was so first was with respect to i could tell a lot of stories like this about gender interactions but the other <laughs> the second and i would say significant aspect was that that when we present spirituality it is this is something which i had to learn by experience that quoting scripture does not have the same weight 
with western audiences especially new western audiences as it has with indian audiences in india if you quote scripture oh you are so learned but in the west if you quote too much uh, to not in the west to a western audience if you quote too much scripture it actually can be a disqualification can't you think for yourself you are just towing the party line so they would like it that you draw wisdom from a ancient tradition but you you present the wisdom don't just quote it to me don't just parrot it to me yeah so so that again it is no so in one sense we may say that uh, we are presenting wisdom from a ancient tradition but that it does not give credibility as what we speak how we make the message intelligible to people so that is also a reflection of the individualistic ethos so we could say india and eastern cultures are a little more community based and west is much more individual based so again i don't want to generalize because there are india is complicated west is also complicated but in general it is uh, people are not interested so much in or not in not interested they are averse to religious organizations and religious hierarchies they are interested in spiritual individuals so it is it is not what you quote or where you come from but it is who you are it is how you address issues how you answer questions how you interact that is what shapes people's receptivity so in that sense we can quote authority but quoting authority is no is no guarantee of earning authority it is authority has to be earned and it's a it's a slow painstaking process that is one of the things that i uh, learned i would say so let's say one is in terms of interacting with people the second is with respect to presenting things with respect to you know what we focus on what is that we can't just quote authority that was second and I, and third now again i could go into many things but third was uh, the focus of what we present the iskon conventionally has focused on the ontological aspects of spirituality you are not the body or the soul that there is god and krishna is god hmm. and uh, so basically the nature of like earlier i talked about the spiritual truths that there exists a soul there exists god and we need, we are his servants things like that but overall in the west it is not so much philosophical spirituality as applied spirituality okay if a soul exists how does it make a difference in my life if god exists if there is ultimate reality how does it make a difference in my life so in that terms of applied spirituality so applied spirituality means i found that the biggest domain for presenting krishna consciousness broadly i found it a four domains where i see the rising of sattva in the western world so one is the domain of mindfulness psychology basically the domain of the mind there's a lot of trouble and distress at the level of the mind and that is where people are open to not only open actively seeking uh you could say um, non biological solutions i don't want to take chemicals to heal my mind uh, is there some other way so meditation yoga mindfulness spirituality this is where people are open the second is <clears throat> environmental consciousness <clears throat> there also again science is there but there is something more than science required to actually change people's way of living so that's why and third is um, with respect to yoga so and fourth is with, with respect to veganism so basically if you see all these four nobody is concerned about god and soul but all these four are ways in which we are functioning in the world Uh, how do i take care of my body how do i take take care of my mind how do i take care of the environment how do i interact with other life forms so veganism basically so these if we can present our wisdom our traditions wisdom in a way that makes a difference to people's current concerns that is where we will be able to reach out to people Mm, addressing so, their their current concerns mm, that's that's really good so so what happens with respect and so addressing now we may say isn't this always required yeah it is but if you consider say for example indians in america now again i don't want to generalize 
at all. See, Indians have a religious instinct, quite quite a strong religious instinct. So, for most Indians, you don't have to tell them why to practice bhakti. So, after spending some time in, in uh, a significant amount of time in India dealing with skeptical questions, and then in America dealing with skeptical questions, I realized it's a huge difference. In India, actually, we are not creating faith. People already have faith, but there are some intellectual reservations they have because of their education, because of their contemporary culture. So we just remove the obstacles for them to act on their natural faith. Mm. Now, we remove obstacles from them to act on their natural faith. So uh, that means most people, I don't know how it will be one or two generations later, but most people have had parents or grandparents going to the temple. Most people have had homes where there's some kind of altar. Some festivals are celebrated. And there is an overall religious instinct. So in India, it's almost as if we are just removing the coverings on faith. So that people can act on their, you could say, natural piety or natural faith. Whereas in the West, we have to, in one sense, create that faith. <laughs> so, so that's a very big challenge. So for example, in the West, when people go to a temple, why, or India also, why people go to a temple, they understand that, that, that there is God and I should be worshipping God. And okay, there are many temples. Which temple do I feel good? Which temple is the best for me? And they'll go there. So we, it's a natural acting. But in the West, so religion or connection with transcendence is not an intrinsic concern. That instinct is not there so much. And if it is there among people, those people will mostly go to the religion of their birth, religion of their parents. So if people have a natural religious instinct, they will go to Christianity or Judaism or whatever. Yeah. So when will they explore other traditions? Gener unless they are exceptional seekers on their own. Now, there are a few seekers who are like serious seekers, but they're not many like that. And we cannot have a movement catering only to say extraordinary seekers like are described in Journey Home, they are Radhanat Maj Mentor Search. If you have to reach to a broader audience, we have to address people's current concerns. Mm. So how to go about doing that? So I found that talking about the mind and uh, uh, you could say virtues, about values and virtues that can help us manage our mind, help us improve our relationship. So this is not just self-help. The self-help sounds a bit too utilitarian. So, but we need to present applied spirituality. So um, if we do that, then there is a, we can connect with people. If we present direct spirituality, then we can't connect with people much. And when we talk about applied spirituality, maybe I will share one diagram. See, we also may talk about applied spirituality in ISKCON. Yeah. But when we talk about that, what we mean is applying spirituality is, is you should chant Hare Krishna and you should come to the temple and you should worship, uh, you should worship the deities. Right. But that is not what people have in mind when they talk about applied spirituality. For them, applied spirituality means how can I become more tolerant and forgiving? Or how can I become more forgive? How can I forgive others? <laughs> how can I find a more meaningful life? How can I find more meaning in my life? Right. So, or mm, how, how can I find inner satisfaction? How can I be equipoised amidst life's ups and downs? So those are their concerns. So let me show you here. Okay, here. So here, so we can have three approaches to spirituality. One is textual spirituality, where say, for example, now I have also taught Bhakti Shastri and we can go deep into Shastra. You know. What does this verse exactly mean? Or oh, this Acharya has given three different meanings of this verse. And why does this verse come after this verse? What is the flow of this chapter? For those who have already accepted a tradition, accepted a text as sacred and precious, Textual spirituality is enormously appealing for them. Hmm? Then there is traditional spirituality. By traditional spirituality, what I mean is that each tradition, various traditions across the world have their own praxis, their practices by which one can grow spiritually. So in our case, 
when we talk about applied spirituality what we are talking about actually is traditional spirituality so associate with devotees read books chant the holy names worship the deities this is traditional spirituality and you could say applied or applicational spirituality that's a, a third circle so this is where how can i how can i be more peaceful how can i have but there are two three concepts which from the bhagavad gita which people can relate with very people want to understand say for example one is samatva how can i stay equipoised how can i stay calm and composed in life's ups and downs then another is antah sukha how can i find inner happiness how can i be even thoughtful people even even if they live in a materialistic society so now later they realize I, i can't just depend on others for or externals for happiness so how can i find inner happiness and the third is compassion how can i how can i see others in a more holistic non judgmental spiritual way and that comes by panditah samadarshinah see everybody equally so these are what people are concerned about so to the extent we can present our spiritual wisdom from a applicational perspective to address people's current concerns so to that extent they can take it up and um, uh, maybe a fourth point i will add is that you cannot expect or demand commitment that is something very important that it's um, it's you know the way i used to we used to do college preaching in india is we have a retreat and then after a retreat you know therefore we are so fortunate to have the opportunity to chant the holy names so how many of you will start 16 rounds after this and right. then maybe 50% would raise hands and then 25% would raise hands you know how many of you start eight rounds how many of you start four rounds and people just take it up uh, but we cannot do that in the west it is it is it has to be very gradual so let people come at their pace so i felt that and people uh, people are interested but if we if but if we don't present properly then we'll alienate a lot of people yeah so i could go on in that direction but these are the broad things i felt i guess the gender differences the authority differences the yeah. focus differences and the expectation differences thank you so much i, I guess a question from for me would be that doing all this and getting all this experience in 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 you know outreach in in the US and everything what was your end strategy in ex strategy is maybe a bad word but what is your end result desired result when you meet someone like and you're only there for like few minutes or 30 minutes or whatever the talk is like what's your what's your what's your goal there okay say i see myself uh as a sharer of resources for raising consciousness wow so i i don't <laughs> so oh. i don't see myself as a preacher of a particular organization i don't see myself even as so much as a teacher of a particular book yes i am a member of a particular organization i teach based on a particular book primarily but i see myself primarily uh, more than that as a or fundamentally you could say as a as somebody who's offering others resources for raising their consciousness so now it's up to them how much they take the resource and how much they raise their consciousness mm. so i was in alachua in alachua we have a many we have a very uh, very good community of uh, devotees uh, mostly shri prabhu disciples and others also so this might seem self congratulatory but i see it as the mercy of my spiritual master sri navishna also guided me in this direction so i gave a, a seminar i gave a three day course over there and once shri prabhupada one prabhupada disciple mata ji came with her daughter he says that you know my daughter doesn't like to attend any programs but she b- before you came she had heard a couple of your classes on youtube and she has attended the full course and she wants to say something so she was maybe a t- t- teenager maybe 15 16 or something like that and she said that you know i have never heard such a non judgmental presentation of krishna consciousness till now so i i felt quite grateful to hear that so the point is that uh, if we there is another preacher who told me this this is in india he said that uh, 
you know your classes are not contaminated by any management agenda i said what do you mean by that <laughs> it is a funny comment appreciation but what he meant was that that i i am not associated with any particular project i have never been a manager i have always been a writer and a teacher so i don't need my audience to do something generally if a preacher is preaching in a particular temple they want manpower for the temple i'm not saying that that is wrong right they want manpower for the temple and they just not, not just human resources for the temple but they actually want the human resources to cooperate with their vision of how the temple should go mm. but that is not something which uh, i have ever needed and i'm not i'm not in any way uh, judging or criticizing others who do that because they are also serving in their own way and that's a valuable service and for many people uh, they would like it okay you know okay i learned about krishna consciousness what should i do tell me now a b c d and that's how they are structured and when they have a clear trajectory they can grow for some people okay i will figure it out once i understand this then i'll decide what i want to do so we need to have room in our movement even for people who need that space to think and grow at their pace so that is what i try to do i try to offer resources for raising consciousness oh i really like that i like that story about the it seems that a lot of young people will pick up on that immediately if there's some kind of judgmentalness or some kind of agenda in what you're saying even devotee ch- kids will pick up and that that in itself will turn people off it's just yeah, very interesting true. um let's talk a little bit about uh your the love that you have for bhagavad gita and the, your daily writing of uh, i don't know what you said it's 200 300 words or something or 600 words of 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 daily gita realizations that you email out to i don't know how many people do you have on that list yeah okay hmm see i was always a good reader as i said i like to read books and i always had a desire to write yeah uh, before i was introduced to krishna consciousness i didn't know what to write So I didn't have so many ideas to share. Once I started, uh, started practicing Krishna consciousness and started sharing, then I started writing a lot. So I've written about twenty-five books till now. Around two thousand eleven, I had a fracture. I fell and I had a fracture in the same leg where I had polio. So for some time, it seemed I might not be able to travel again much. Fortunately, I recovered and I've been able to travel reasonably. But so at that time, I needed some engagement. yeah so i had been exploring various things so i had not um, that was the time when i internet had started becoming big in india and i started ex- exploring how uh, outreach is done online so one thing i noticed is that there are many christian preachers who send daily messages daily passages based on the bible not just quotes from the bible but their reflections based on the bible there are quite a, there are at least a dozen i found who have wrote on the bible there are at least uh, half a dozen who do it on the quran but i couldn't find a single not just within iskon single teacher but even in the whole hindu world who actually shared wisdom in a written form on the gita every day mm. so i started talking with the different senior devotees and many many who were very effective teachers of the bhagavad gita but they all were busy in their own way and i suggested to them generally in our movement there's one thing whoever is the giver of the suggestion be has to become the implementer of that suggestion also <laughs> so so then i got blessing some senior devotees and i decided to myself attempt it so i so basically i tried to write a 300 word meditation on the bhagavad gita every day i take one verse and i try to explain it in a contemporary applicable way so i try to do two things you know logical and practical there's a logical flow to it whatever i'm saying and then a, what am i writing and something some practical understanding and application so i was not sure how much i would be able to write but by krishna's mercy since 2011 i have been writing more or less every day so we have more than 4000 articles on the gita on the gita daily.com now and uh, we have about uh, 6000 subscribers by email about 15 20000 subscribers on whatsapp the gita daily facebook page has a Gita Daily, Gita Daily Facebook page has about seven hundred thousand followers, uh, but that doesn't necessarily 700, mean that many. Seven hundred thousand. Well, that many people have liked it, but that doesn't mean that many people read the Gita Daily. But 
That's great. It's still amazing. So see what happens is the written format, the videos are relatively easier to watch. Yeah. The written format requires a little bit more application and effort to read. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not giving uh, motivational messages alone. Mm, it is more of uh, understanding of the Gita. So right. what I found is that if you consider the genre of self-help, mm, in many ways, Christians were the pioneers for uh, presenting spiritual help from a religious perspective. Dale, there was Norman Vincent Peale who wrote The Power of Positive Thinking. If you read the Bible, there is not much self in it. There is quite a bit of help in the sense that there is not much self-knowledge. The Bible may talk about the soul, but it doesn't talk about the nature of the soul at all, the way the Bhagavad Gita talks about it. And there are verses in the Bible which, uh, which can be motivational, which can be inspirational. Somebody is in fear, somebody is in uncertainty. You may, I'll walk through the valley of death. But I'll be protected by God. Stay still and hear the words of God. I have plans for you to prosper you in future. There are many quotes like that. But if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, if you want to ask, if, you, if somebody asks you, can you share an inspiring verse from the Bhagavad Gita to me, for me? Now, if that person is an entirely new person, you really can't quote a verse from the Gita. Yeah. The Gita, there are many verses which are inspiring, but the inspiration becomes evident when we understand the worldview of the Gita. So the point I was making is, if you consider self-help, in the Bible, there is help, but not much self. In the Gita, there is self, but not much help. So unless you fully understand the self, unless you understand the worldview of the Gita, it's difficult to take verses from the Gita and, uh, and see them as inspirational. So how we could take the self and show the help based on the knowledge of the self? That is what I try to do through my Gita Dili articles. And I have several courses on the Gita also. I have Bhakti Shastri course for those who are serious students of the Gita. There are, I think the mind was the, one of the first online courses. So there are 108 classes on the all 700 verses, systematic study of the Gita. Then I have done a Gita light course, which is also available on my website, brief introduction to the Gita. Then I've done a 52 session Gita key, 51 session Gita key verses course. And I'm planning to do a, many more courses on the Gita, explaining things from various contempt, explaining how the Gita can be approached from contemporary perspectives. So what I'm doing, if you consider Gita to be the center, then what are contemporary concerns? So the Gita from an environmental perspective, the Gita from a mindfulness perspective, the Gita from the perspective of, as I said, equality, equality of vision. Nowadays, we should not be judgmental, we should be egalitarian. So Gita from that perspective. So I, that is my long-term vision. I've been writing articles in these con on various topics in Gita Daily, but I'm now planning to move, make various uh, courses which connect with the Gita. So the Gita will be like the node and address various contemporary concerns based on Gita wisdom. Wow. How do you not repeat any ideas that you, like, how does it always, I know it says, you know, it's always fresh wherever you bite it, it's sweet, no matter where it is, but... As far as like the concepts that you come up with relating to the Gita, how do you not repeat anything? Yeah, I wouldn't say that I never repeat anything at all, but I do try to make sure that uh, there are some amount of fresh insights in every article. Mm -hmm. uh, two, three things. First is that uh, you know, about writing, it is said that if you steal from one author, it's plagiarism. If you steal from a thousand authors, it's creativity. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what that means is, I don't know if I'm Krishna conscious or not, but I'm definitely Gita conscious. That means whenever I read anything, especially whenever I, in my Gita Lili articles, I try to have as much as possible, some memorable play of words. So for example, now, in 1858, I wrote an article that we may we may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. Mm -hmm. So, with pain, but not in pain. Or on 1716, I wrote an article that uh, it talks about inner satisfaction that we can't always be grateful for all situations, but we can be grateful in all situations. Mm -hmm. So, 
so like that i try to play with words so for example we are all parts of krishna so be a part of krishna be not apart from krishna so <laughs> a part and apart right. Right. so in fact based on the gita daily articles itself uh, i have published two books which are basically 360 each of them are 365 quotable quotes inspired by the gita's wisdom Mm-hmm. those are probably among the uh the most widely distributed of my books so basically i try to have some play of words so when i whenever i am reading anything hearing anything or even articulating things so at that time i, I if i any time i come across a striking uh, word usage a striking turn of phrase i try to see how it can be connected with the gita's wisdom so i generally recite the gita regularly so at least one chapter daily or whatever so the gita's verses are always there in the background of my mind you could say and whenever i see some striking turn of phrase i try to connect it with the gita verse and then present the wisdom present the two together as a article so yeah. overall it's crea- it's creative it's it's sometimes demanding especially i'm traveling and i have many programs try yeah. to come up with the article but it's krishna's kindness that i have been able to write and uh, there has been a, re- a reasonably good response many devotees have told me how uh, reading the gita that act two three things one is that by reading gita daily they started appreciating how the gita is is relevant to their lives because many of us may feel that the gita is a little bit philosophical and the bhagavatam and the other books are more relishable because there are past times from which you can do practical lessons but the gita is also having a lot of relatable wisdom that's one thing another somebody would have told me that when they have gone they're going through difficulties especially relational difficulties or ment- uh, difficulties with the mind i write a lot on the mind 6.5 6.6 6.25 those are the verses on which i have written the most articles so <clears throat> 6.25 26 also so so they say that especially then dealing with issues with mental troubles they found that quite helpful so that way i'm trying to do some service and krishna is reciprocating devotees are finding them helpful new people are also connecting with it there are quite a few uh, christians who read the gita daily really they say that, yeah they subscribed for that and they say that you know, it's the one one person he actually is a he's in europe he's a reverend so he wrote to me and he told me that you know almost 90 95% of what you write in gita daily i can easily connect with that because it's something similar to what i read in the bible but it's it's articulated in a different way so wow. again in, uh, so again see i'm i'm not if you talk about those three circles no textual uh, traditional and applicational so this is more of textual and applicational so it is not that at the end of the gita daily article i says you should chant hari krishna you should worship the deities or it's not that i'm not saying that but that is not it is okay this wisdom if we understand those will be the natural results yeah. but this wisdom how we can uh, how we can use it to infuse our life with virtues and we can find uh, a direction a compass in our life that's what i try to do with the gita hmm. i think that sometimes devotees don't want to admit that in different places according to time place and circumstance there's a there's a way to communicate with people you can they can connect with and i feel like you've kind of cracked the code there with with uh i guess a western audience that you know because sometimes the the idea is that okay we just do what you know shila propad's program was it's the hari nam and the prashadam distribution the sunday feast which is amazing and it's that's how, that's some people do connect with that for sure still but there is something to say about meeting people where they're at um whether it be a young audience or uh you know more progressive audience uh and 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 not trying to like the things that you you just mentioned like not trying to exactly you know chant hari krishna and worship the deities but apply you know give them resources of sp- upliftment like you said and kind mm. of give them those resources and things i think that's really 
really brilliant. And I think a lot of devotees can benefit from hearing your experiences and try to even take that and use it in their own way, in their own outreach of Krishna consciousness. Yes, so, I mean, you made a very important point that I won't say I have cracked the code, but at least I recognize that right. we have to spend time not just speaking to the audience, but hearing from the audience. Yeah. That is singular. So as much as I try to follow is that you know, on the class, Vyasasana, on the class, you speak. But after the class, hear. Hear from people who want to talk with you. Hear from the organizers. Try to understand the context where people are coming from. That's very important for learning. And you now we may say, we will just do what Prabhupada did. But that is an oversimplification. Because Prabhupada himself didn't do one thing alone. At a very dramatic level, if you want to see, the way Prabhupada did outreach in America and he did outreach in India. There's a huge difference. Prabhupada in America was basically, basically not just chant Hare Krishna, but basically it was like move into the temple. That was the main outreach. And it worked dramatically at that time. We had what Hagaru Prabhu called the Hare Krishna explosion. But when Prabhupada came to India, he, there was his Western disciples uh, created a sensation. He, along with his Western disciples, created a sensation. But practically no one was ready to move into the temples in India. So Prabhupada himself devised an entirely different program. And that program was life membership primarily. Mm. That basically Prabhupada would go to different Indian people's houses, take some prasad, give some class, and then they would contribute for building temples. They would give a significant contribution. That was a life membership program and they could come and stay in the temples. Now, even some of the people who, say for example, the Juhu temple was one of the biggest projects, the toughest projects, because not necessarily the biggest, the toughest projects where Prabhupada faced very severe opposition. And there are many life members who helped Prabhupada in an enormously, uh, you know, in enormous ways. At the same time, there are no interactions. Now, I had talked with uh, Giriraj Maharaj, I talked with Radhanath Maharaj and others who have interacted with these life members They afterwards also because uh, they were in Mumbai. So, most of, these life, most of these life members, they were already, they were already from a pious family. Many of them already were initiated disciples of other gurus. And most of them were, you could say from our perspective, Advaitic or Mayavadi gurus. But Prabhupada did not make issue with that. Prabhupada did not even demand that you should chant Hare Krishna to them or chant 16 rounds or become initiated. So Prabhupada engaged them from where they were. So he just encouraged them. So Prabhupada himself did different things at different times. And very different things you could say. So if I consider, you know, in, in India, if this two in West, becoming a devotee meant moving into the preaching meant getting people to move into the temple. Yeah. In India, Preaching meant getting people to contribute so that we could build temples. So now if we consider our movement, most of our movement is neither here nor here. Not at the level of making life members who just give some donations. Not at the level of having people move into the temple. Most of our movement is somewhere in between. That is the congregation. Congregation is people who are much more dedicated than life members. They're not just giving their money. They want to do other services. They want to themselves practice bhakti. But most of the people who are coming into our temples, very few of them have intentions of moving into the temple. Even moving into the temple even for a short time, what to speak of lifelong. <laughs> so in one sense, you know, we are in uncharted territory right now as a movement. Uncharted means Prabhupada, during Prabhupada's time, only these two were there. The idea of a congregation, nowadays we have weekly programs. And it's very common, you know, okay, we have weekly Bhagavad Gita class, not just in temple, but in the different devotees' houses or different people's houses. So actually, it was, I think, the first, the concept of a weekly program at somebody's house that first happened in 1983, if I'm not mistaken. In all of Prabhupada's time, there was no concept of a weekly program. You do a one-time program in people's house, and then they come to the temple, and in the temple, there are regular classes. Say, every evening Bhagavad Gita class, and ultimately, the expectation of people will move into the temple. So yes, uh, diff not only different places uh, have different needs, but you could say even different times have different needs. So we as a movement are in a very different time from what it was during Prabhupada's times. Hmm. 
So of course, Prabhupada has given us timeless principles, which we which we need to share, but we need to share them intelligently. So in a way that we attract people toward Krishna and not uh, push people away from Krishna. Mm. So this is something which uh, maybe I'll just speak, I'll take a few minutes to speak this. This is something which when I travel, uh, I meet, how should I put it politely? I'm a lot of people who are casualties of preaching come and meet me. Really? <laughs> really? Casualties, of, casualties of preaching means, you know, you know. Uh, so, for example, I was in America in one city and this husband came and met me and he said that his wife was a follower of some other spiritual teacher. And that's her family has been following for many generations, not many generations, at least two, one or two generations. Their whole family is a follower of that teacher. And they came to a particular program and there was one preacher who came and spoke. You know, that particular teacher, if you follow him, you will go to hell. Now she felt so, it was not just offended, it was just uh, devastated practically. Wow. So, so and now the speaker who spoke this, I know that, know that speaker is a senior devotee in our movement and he's also dedicated in his own way. And his mood is that you know, Prabhupada said one moon is better than a thousand stars. So we want one person who is ready to give up all misconceptions and just surrender to Krishna. And he says, I want to present, I want that person. And maybe their intentions are good, but we have to also consider the effects. The effect is that unfortunately, we may be looking for one moon. But actually, whether we find the one moon or not, we end up extinguishing a thousand stars. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. that's unfortunate. So that's why when I said that, that providing resources for people to raise their consciousness, if somebody wants to come to the level of becoming a moon, that's wonderful. But if somebody wants a star and this, that star can light, can be little, little brighter. That's wonderful also. Yeah. No, if somebody is just, uh, again, I don't, we don't want to refer to people in abstract ways, but if somebody is just a stone and uh, somebody, uh, but that's hidden, if the star, the luminosity, little, little spark comes out, that's also good. So, so when I talk with that, uh, I, I talk with the husband and then we had a long talk, and then she, he brought his wife and I talked with her also. And the first thing I did was I apologize to her, you know, that, you know, that whoever spoke like this, they don't represent the moment per se. There are, don't reject the moment just because of what you heard from one person. Yeah. And also, then I explained that um, two things, basically, when I deal with uh, the casualties of preaching. Uh, first is that ultimately, it is not your, it is not your relationship with the institution or with a particular member of the institution, it is your relationship with, with the ultimate reality as you conceive it. And this moment has provided thousands of people, we could say millions of people, resources for developing that relationship. So you can, rather than rejecting the moment based on one particular experience, or maybe two, three experiences also, see the resources that you can find, which help you to raise your consciousness and to develop your relationship with ultimate reality. And those resources are available and they're available in a very, very broad gamut. That's the first thing. And second thing is that it's uh, we also as a as a movement we can say that uh, uh, the capacity for honest self criticism hmm, that is I would say it's not that it's not there but it has it it is developing and uh, so things are not black and white things are not black and white. And uh, what I mean by black and white in this case, that's an obvious statement you may say. But the key thing I realized is that, that uh, you know, we often reduce people to abstract philosophical categories. But people are conscious persons who have many dimensions to their being. What I mean by that is that, say, if I say somebody is, somebody is following a Mayavadi guru, and therefore we say they are Mayavadis. Not really. Now, they, may be, they may be following a Mayavadi guru, but actually they may not even know what is Mayavad. 
and they may follow that guru maybe because of that person's personal charisma maybe because that person's center has a nice cultural atmosphere maybe they are going there because they just like to like the spiritual people over there so philosophy is only one aspect of why people go to a tradition so right. when we reduce people to a philosophy oh you are following this teacher so that's why you are a mayavadi well that becomes a that we are reducing people to categories so that is that is a dangerous thing to do so rather than reducing people to categories if we see them as individuals and okay so if somebody so the what i try to do is somebody says i am following a particular guru i am going i am following a particular teacher yeah so what i would say is that yeah you know in in a, in today's world where most people are materialistic it's good that he has spiritual spiritual interest and inclinations yeah. so what about that particular teacher attracts you and then once they start speaking that but they also feel valued okay you're not rejecting what i am doing and then when we understand what about it about that particular spiritual path or spiritual teacher or spiritual uh, book or whatever it attracts them then we have the opportunity to show them how that can that is available even within krishna consciousness yeah so i think that black and white approach is 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 very dangerous is is quite we end up alienating far more people than we attract hmm. and uh, krishna consciousness in my understanding at least we would have reached far far more people if we have if we have a less confrontational approach and a more of a <laughs> yes true thank you so much uh, chaitanya charan prabhu um i really love the points you're bringing up there at the end about black and white and less confrontational it's very valuable and i think devotees can learn from that for for sure so if you want to get in touch with chaitanya charan prabhu he has a number of websites and also a facebook page so let's start there facebook page facebook.com slash Chaitanya Charan. He has the podcast, as I said, uh, which is called The Monk's Podcast. You can find that there on that Facebook page, and you can also find it on YouTube um, under his YouTube page, Chaitanya Charan. And then he also has his um, website, thespiritualscientist.com. And then I was I was tickering earlier at the bottom, uh, the gitadaily.com. So this is how you can get in touch with Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. He has so much content that he puts out and you can take advantage of it on Facebook, YouTube, via email as well, WhatsApp even. I'm sure there's instructions there on the websites on the website. Um Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, thank you so much for joining me. I really enjoyed our our, our conversation and I enjoy learning from you. Uh it's always a pleasure and uh you I love the way you categorize things like okay, you know, there's this one step to third step and then it's, i love that and it's, and it shows your um your 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 depth of of knowledge and thinking and and i love that uh, uh, so much thank you so much prabhu appreciate it thank you prabhu for inviting me and thank you for your very pertinent and uh, you could say very uh, pertinent as well as thoughtful questions and of course before i end i would like to express my debt to you my as i said in the beginning my monks podcast is a spin off i could say from your no. uh, podcast <laughs> so i i watched some of your podcast and said this is a brilliant idea and then during the lockdown when i was not traveling when i was to travel of course i used to give uh, give classes but i was also used to meet many senior devotees and that would nourish me mm. so i thought that virtually i am giving classes so why not i also get association but then that's how i thought that i could start the podcast and by krishna's mercy it worked out quite well so i focus more on uh, you could say you told me that your thrust is the, is the story behind the person that's yes. what your so yours are more of you could say human interest yeah and yeah. that you are get a very diverse panel of participants you get i focus i am a more you could say intellectual person i live in my head a lot so i focus more on issues right and discuss but the whole idea of the podcast you, you are the pioneer in that and i'm oh, and so i would much. express like to put on my record my gratitude to you for oh. having started that initiative and given me the idea and inspired me and thank you for inviting me all the very best thank in your you podcast so much. also i see your some point. of your podcast you are quite expert in 
diffusing volatile settings <laughs> and expert, expertly taking things forward so all the very best thank you thank you so much prabhu please stay on i'm i'm going to turn off the uh, recording thank you everyone for joining if you like this podcast please check it out on youtube and facebook um and all podcasting platforms hi krishna and have a great rest of your evening haribo